Brett, obviously Dana isn't the big, biggest fan of Ariel Hawani. Who's your colleague? He's not. Oh, yeah. <laughs> is this breaking news he's to not? you? What, what, happened, what happened there? Yeah. Now he's your colleague now at ESPN, so you kind of reap the benefits there. As Dana is almost always going to come to you with the breaking news, right or wrong? Sure. I, well, that, no, there is some some definite truth to that. Here, here's how I look at that, and and I'll be honest, like I, I don't. I don't want people to think that, you know, Dana doesn't like Ariel, so he, he, he then comes to me. You know, I think that there is some absolute truth that I, I benefit from it. I can't, I'm not going to sit here and, and tell you and lie to you and say that, that I don't, you know, but I, I, uh, I think that Ariel and Dana could, I don't know if they can ever fix what, what's going on between them. I don't think that that's really my business. I don't really root for or against that. I mean, I, I know that I've I've covered this sport, like I just told you, since UFC 98. I live in Las Vegas. I've interviewed Dana a billion times, you know, before the UFC was ever on ESPN. And, and, and now there is a there is a partnership there between UFC and ESPN. And I can tell just from Dana, but also just the organization as a whole. Um, you know, they want to work with ESPN and they want they want to the conversations have changed and they're more frequent and, and this or that. But I really wouldn't say that my relationship has changed with Dana all that much from from even, you know, Ariel joining ESPN. I just I want to have a relationship with, with, with Dana White and with any source, really, that is completely independent of any other journalist out there. And and while I will acknowledge that, that, that Dana's um, and Ariel's beef, I guess, is probably good for me. I you know, I don't, I don't, I don't really look at it that way. I, I, as a journalist, I find sources, I cultivate them, I form relationships. You know, I cover this sport, and and uh, you know, regardless, I guess, of what else is going on between anybody else. So, so why do you think you've been able to maintain a good relationship with Dana and the UFC, as opposed to the friction between <laughs> Dana and Ariel? Is it just Ariel? <laughs> is it just him and Dana? <laughs> they just don't click, or? You're just such a good dude. Well, I think it's about. I can tell you're a good dude. Wait, no, but I, I would say, and, and Brett, <laughs> you could you, you could agree or disagree with me. There is a certain thing called embargo that um, I think fans have to realize sometimes too. They spend a lot of money on advertising and things like that, and then if you break a story, it's like ruin somebody's surprise party. You know what I mean? So I don't know if that was a big part of it. But Brett, do you agree or disagree? It's kind of sometimes it's an embargo issue. Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't. Embargoes are kind of a weird thing, you know. I mean, so here's the thing: because uh, like so breaking like a story comes, or not break a story, or like how does that work? If someone comes to me with a story that I had no idea was going to happen, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm, I'm sitting in my pajamas in my home office and I have not done you know any work or, or any kind of conversation about a, a particular thing, right? And someone comes to me and says, hey, this is going to happen, you know, um, we, we want you to know about it. But but we don't want you to write it right now, you know, because, uh, because for whatever reason, like maybe it's not completely finished or, you know, there's there's still there's still kind of some leeway where it could fall apart or, you know, what the situation you just brought up of like maybe there's some marketing into it. Yeah. It, here's the information, but don't write it yet. If I knew nothing about it, then I can't just turn around and, and, and say, oh, I'm, I'm running with this right now. I, I don't feel I don't think that that's being ethical. But if, if I hear about something and, and I, I make some phone calls and I find out that it's true and someone says, says, hey, you know, we we're going to we have this planned or we're going to do this or that. And we would prefer you that you not hold it. I'm probably not going to hold it, you know, because that's not journalism either. Sure. Um, so, so that's that's how embargo is. Uh, it, you know, sometimes in this industry, yeah, someone comes to you with something that you didn't know anything about. And I think at that point, you can't just run with it. But right. if I'm tracking down a story or if I'm finding something that maybe someone doesn't want out there or, or, or whatever, if I get the story and it's accurate and someone's asking me not to run it, but I have it on my own, then I'm, I'm going to run it. That's that's how it works. But do you reach out to Dana when you have an idea if I might be happening or no? Is that one of the phone calls you make? Or? I do, yeah. Yeah, I reach out to Dana pretty pretty constantly. I mean, he's one of the guys that I, I do bug a lot. And, and you know, Dana's been, been very... Um, 
generous with his time and he gets back to me and, and there are times where he says that no that that that's uh, I'm, I'm wrong and this, this that what I'm hearing is, is inaccurate and there are times when he's like yeah yeah that's that's true you know and, and you can confirm and he'll confirm it for me and then when I write a report I'll say that Dana White confirmed it you know so yeah, I, I'm, I'm constantly reaching out to Dana. I, I don't know why you want it. I mean, in this, in this job covering this sport, um, I would imagine that that's part of the job is to reach out to Dana on a frequent basis. And, and I happen to have a, a, a good enough relationship with him where, where he actually gets back most of the time, not every time, but he'll get back quite a bit. Brett, it's, it's really interesting and kind of awesome to talk to you because we're getting a different perspective that the fans, I think you can kind of let people know how difficult or how intricate being a journalist is just in 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 sports in general and with journalism there's times where certain stories are opinion pieces and certain stories are factual pieces so I was wondering when do you use what when do you make it an opinion piece and when are you just sticking straight to the facts yeah that's an interesting question because for a long time at ESPN I was the only person who was really putting together content on MMA so I kind of had to do both I mean mean, I would I would say the thing about that is you have to do one or the other and you have to make it very clear yes. which one you're doing you know you can't you can't blur the two so um you know i i i tend to kind of stay on this on the straight and narrow that's just um that's just more my style i like to just present people the facts and you know let them come to the conclusions themselves but i mean i have opinions of course i mean i'll cover this sport for a while now and um so yeah, I, if I have an opinion, I'll, I'll write it. And ESPN is great about you know not really forcing me to. If I don't have an opinion on something, they're not like, well, hey, make one up because because we need something right now. Um, but they're also great about you know them saying, hey, if, if you have an opinion, then yeah, we'll take it. You know, go ahead and, and write it for us. So I kind of have the best of both worlds. I mean, I, I, again, I'll credit ESPN to that that they're just open to having me. They want me to write whatever is the best content, you know. And so if that's news, then I'll write that. And if well, I have an opinion on something, something strong, then I'll do that as well. All right, Brett, listen. <laughs> Brett, anything else to tell the fans about the great Brett Okamoto? No, nothing about the great Brett Okamoto. I appreciate the uh, the interview, man. I did want to tell you, Matt, the, uh, it's, it's funny. I mean, you're so, so as I told you, I came in and started covering the sport at 98. So, so you only had three fights while I was covering the sport, but it was... It was it was funny. I have a distinct memory about you as a fighter, and and more more so as like like me getting an interview with you. And uh, I think it was it probably was was ahead of you had a fight at UFC 109, and uh, and that fight was in Vegas. And I was still working at the newspaper at the time, so I definitely would have covered it. And uh, I think I I got an interview with you through uh, the, US, the old um, a guy who used to work at the UFC PR department. His name was Joe Fernandez. I'm sure you remember him. I think uh-huh. you guys were pretty close. He was. A, yeah. He did he my video. He guy. did my video blogs. Very nice guy. He's the one who got yeah, me yeah. first behind a uh, camera with the video blogs. I loved Joe, man. He was he was great. I only knew him like, like he was only there for a couple of years when I started covering, and then he he moved on to other stuff. But uh, I was always like great relationship with Joe. He said, "I'll get you an interview with Matt." You know, we're still in New York, and we're doing like some media stuff around New York, and then you're gonna fly to Las Vegas. I'm like, okay, cool. So I was in the the newsroom. And I, I like I was waiting for Joe to call me, and he calls me, and he puts you on the phone, and you guys, you guys were in the back seat of some car, you know, driving around. And at the time, man, I, I think I was like 24 years old. Again, still just kind of getting into this sport, and I was like oh, excited. Man. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna interview Matt Sarah. I'm gonna write a story about Matt Sarah. And uh, you guys had the windows down. I think it was like, was it a summer fight? Was UFC 109? I, the weather must have been nice because I feel like the, the, the windows were down. Yeah. You guys were driving through New York. And you saw like three people that you knew. And so like you would get on the phone and you would literally like talk to me for 30 seconds and I was going to get ready to ask you a question. And then you'd see somebody that you knew and you'd start, have to stop the car and you'd jump out and you'd have to have the conversation with guys. I was just sitting in my cubicle just like waiting for you to come back to the car. You came back to the car, the whole thing would repeat itself. And then like at the end you were just like, all right, bro, I got to go. Yeah, good talking to you. I didn't even get to write a story about you that, oh, that week. And I don't say that to put you on the spot, but I've never forgot that, man. Oh that my was, God, did you that think was I was a, a did, funny interview. Did you think I was a pro? Because I definitely wasn't mean spirited. No. <laughs> no, it wasn't mean spirited at all. I just figured you were like the mayor of New York, man, running yes. riding around it's back of the car, and you saw like you know fifteen people that, that you saw. I was like Matt, and your, <laughs> your, your personality, man. You see a guy that you see on the side of the street, I, you're not just going to drive by him. You're going to get out of the car and go talk to him, right? You're that kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, my personality, my ADD. It could be one <laughs> of the. It could be one <laughs> or the other. But Brett, I want to formally uh, apologize for that. You know, and more, and for this interview. No, I'm only That's kidding. Great. This was fun. <laughs>
All is forgiven. Hey, All man. Forgiven, Brad, so much fun. If Hey, listen, you're in New York. Stop in the studio, man. We'd love to have you in to hang out with us. Yeah, that sounds great. Thanks for having me, guys. All right, Brad. Thank you so much, man. Take care. Great Brett Akimoto. What a nice guy. He's really good. You know, I enjoyed that, man. He is really good. Seriously, I'm not just saying that because he's on the show. Like, that's he's, You're not just, he's listen, stop kissing his ass. He's all right. He heard enough. We already <laughs> know good. that you're trying to get out over in that ESPN spot. I'm sorry, Phoenix. <laughs> I'm sorry. Why can I attack Listen, you? you get on me, I get on you. That's why, why we're I, friends. Why do I have to attack you? I'm so uh, happy you're you feel probably, I mean, during that interview, you probably saw your cauliflower pizza guy. You have to jump out. I've never had ago. that. Yeah. I have never had that. And I'm actually, I need Don't to try it. Don't get me started. We'll lose listeners because I've been talking about it. Say you're, you feel like you're already the king of the division. I feel like most people would then respond, well, what about Habib? Undefeated. He's the champion. What do you mean when you say king? <sighs> Khabib, I already slapped him in his face. I already told you guys that. So it's like, you're going to just, and I beat Connor before him, quicker than him, easier than him. And uh and then he's just gonna ignore that and then he's acting like whatever be he just he's a little big headed right now, you know, so I'm just like whatever. I don't need to fight him anyways, cause I already got a victory over him. So it's like he's just gonna hide out and play play champ and, and act like a good guy and fucking miss her fucking humble fucking Khabib. I'm like, I'm not buying that shit. I don't I don't need to sit around here and fucking chase no nobody. Maybe need new chases. They gotta come this way. So I'm gonna I'm gonna retire that vision as champ. I slap both Connor and Khabib. So how, how did that make anybody uh, a winner? <laughs> If you have not already, hit that subscribe button with its notification bell and leave a comment in the comment box below of what you thought of the video and tune in for more on MMA News Outlet.